Neil Postman, in his classic critique of television culture, amusing ourselves to death, calls Americans, quote, the best entertained and quite likely the least well-informed people in the Western world. Viewers, according to Postman, are fed an endless diet of disinformation, misplaced, irrelevant, fragmented, or superficial information. And he says that such information creates the illusion of knowing something, but in fact leads one away from knowing. Television news, according to Postman, presents us not only with fragmented news, but news without context, without consequences, without value, and therefore without essential seriousness. That is to say, news as pure entertainment. Much of this is the result of the deregulation of the television industry under the Communication Act of 1984 and the emasculation of the Federal Communication Commission under Mark Fowler, a man who believed that television had no greater responsibility to the public than any other appliance, because TV was just, in his words, a toaster with pictures. Thanks to the Communication Act of 1984 and subsequent acts, the present economic structure of television dependent as it is on advertising revenues for operation, owned by large and wealthy corporations, many of them multinational or even foreign-owned, competing for viewers in an ever-tightening market, unburdened by the requirement to operate in the public interest, these things ensure that we will consume programming that supports rather than challenges the status quo. Gone are the days of harvest of shame. The documentary news units of the three major networks before deregulation, ABC, CBS, and NBC, are gone for nearly two decades. One of my first assignments at NBC was working on what turned out to be one of their last news documentaries, a profile of Mehmet Ali Adja called The Man Who Shot the Pope. That was in 1982. Instead, documentary filmmaking has gone independent and has found its new home in cable. And I confess to you, I don't know why we're not more angry about this. Postman asks us, what if there are no cries of anguish to be heard? Who is prepared to take arms against the sea of amusements? To whom do we complain and when? And in what tone of voice, when serious discourse dissolves into giggles, what is the antidote to a culture's being drained by laughter? Jacques Ellul, French sociologist, theologian, <clears throat> and media theorist, raises the stakes of this argument a bit higher, elevating the discussion to a moral plane. He sees the role of modern media, of mass communication, as distracting us from the essential evil of our technological society. A society that strips us of our humanity, separates person from person, and isolates us from our brothers and sisters, and worse of all, from ourselves. Furthermore, by delivering to us enormous, uh, enormous quantities of facts, mass media encourage us to believe, through a sort of intellectual sleight of hand, that we know reality. But we don't. Nor do we want to. In the sphere of intellectual life, Elul says, the major fact of our day is a sort of refusal, refusal unconscious but widespread, to become aware of reality not want to see himself in the real situation which the world constitutes for him. The dramatic characteristic of this era in this sphere is that man no longer grasps anything but shadows. What is the nature, though, of these shadows? And why do they obscure our reality? Television is a medium of pictures and sounds, of lights and colors, and music and movement. It structures its information presentationally as opposed to the propositional structure of speech and writing. That is to say, it recreates uh, or presents to us a mimetic reality, an analog of the human life world. 
its content is far more concrete and sensorily understandable than the abstracted experience of, say, a book. Unlike speech or writing, visual images can't be stopped or questioned, poured over, or studied. They can't be parsed, criticized grammatically, or put to a test of linear logic. Television images simply appear, uh, uh, simply are what they appear to be. Nothing more, nothing less. And so critical thought about the televised image is very, very difficult. On, on an emotional level, we might either like an image or hate an image. But when we see an image, we tend to believe it. In fact, the phrase seeing is believing is a fair principle to explain our culture. The necessary corollary to this principle, however, is that not seeing is not believing. We tend not to believe in those things with which we don't come into constant contact. Imminence is the milieu of television. Transcendence is not. To be sure, Americans give lip service to uh, belief in transcendent realities. They give lip service to belief in God, for instance. But it's not unfair, I think, to question the depth of our cultural commitment to that idea. Consider a few statistics. 96% of Americans say they believe in God. Yet only 45% attend religious services on a weekly basis. Now, lest we still feel too comforted by that 96%, let's also consider the fact that 36% of Americans believe that astrology is scientific, 50% 50 believe in the reality of UFOs, and 80% believe that the U.S. government is hiding E.T. <laughs> by focusing our attention so powerfully on our senses has cut us off from that piece of our psyche that allows us to, if you will, comprehend the incomprehensible. And it's done tremendous damage to our collective experience of transcendence. Television is so profoundly visual that it has a difficult time dealing with any subject matter that's not itself inherently visual. The sensual, material imminence of our image of reality destroys transcendence. So what is it, on balance, that we really do believe in? We believe in those things that are obvious to us, that are imminent to us in our world. In the world that television creates for us, the two things that appear to be most real are crime and show business. Our awareness of crime, our belief in it, if you will, seems to exist disproportionately to its commission. Throughout the 1990s, violent crime rates dropped 6% from a decade earlier, and homicides dropped 13%. Yet in a series of ABC News Washington Post polls during the same period, six times more Americans named crime as America's biggest problem in 1993 than did in 1992. In fact, during the 1990s, the reporting of crime eclipsed the reporting of all other stories, totaling some 7,448 stories between 1993 and 1996 alone. More reports in that time than were aired on the war in Bosnia, the 1996 presidential campaign, the plight of so uh, post-Soviet Russia, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict combined. 